Welcome to Computer Science E1 Lecture 7. This is all about security. So before we dive right into talking about security, I'm going to steal away the focus from David's laptop and just talk a little bit about the most recent uh, problem set. So our problem set 5, multimedia, as you know, uh, you'll need to load Photoshop uh, either on your computer or come use Photoshop on one of the uh, campus machines in a lab. And we provided a very convenient, or what we thought was a very convenient link to a trial version of Adobe Photoshop CS3. Unfortunately, this link, although this link works, the, the trial does not work. And uh, it seems the reason seems to be that uh, Adobe has just moved to the new version of Photoshop CS4, and we're in this sort of transition period where they don't yet have the CS4 trial version available, and they've expired the CS3 version. So. In this limbo period, so what does that mean? Uh, it doesn't mean that we're going to cancel the problem set or anything like that. You can't get out of it that easily, unfortunately. Um, you can actually download Photoshop uh, as part of FAS keyed program, and, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second, from the FAS download site. And um, don't worry about too many of the details. You'll get an email from John pretty soon, hopefully in the next couple of days, with all of the details that you need. Um, you would basically just go to, uh, let's see, it's downloads.fast.harvard.edu, and you'll have to enter in your Harvard ID and PIN to get access to this downloads page. From here, you will download Photoshop, and you'll find it, they have a version for both Mac and PC, but you'll notice that there is a very unfortunate uh, requirement uh, for using Photoshop on your own personal computer and that is that you have to use what's called a keyed version. What this means is that in order for you to load Photoshop and use it on your computer, you must be connected to Harvard's network so that Photoshop can communicate with a pool of uh, licensing servers that we have here uh, so that it will know that someone is using Photoshop under, um, through FAS. So what this means essentially is that not only will you download Photoshop, but you'll have to download the VPN client, which allows you to connect to Harvard's network, and also the key server, which is also on the same page. You'll notice it is here, key server. So that's three things, Photoshop itself, the key server, and the VPN. Uh, you will have to have an FAS account in order to VPN in. And it gets, as you can tell, it's, it's, there's a lot of steps involved, but it will let you use Photoshop on your home computer. The alternative is that you can come to one of the labs on campus. You have access to it, uh, either the Church Street Lab or may maybe one of the Mac labs in the, the, uh, uh, the Science Center, for example. They all have Photoshop installed on there. And so rather than worrying about VPNing in, using keyed software through the FAS download or having to get an FAS account, uh, you can just use one of those computers. So there are options still available in order to get this problem set done. But like I said, forthcoming. Uh, details from John. Over to you. Okay. So we thought we would try a little good cop, bad cop tonight. So it, uh, there's no lecture more engaging than one in which we scare you, it seems, based on many, many times of trying this. And so what we thought we'd do is my role will be to point out and explain all of the bad stuff that can happen to you online, all the bad stuff that can happen to your information, to your identity, to your money, and so forth. And then Dan will sweep in just after you've been terrified, hopefully, and point out technological or sociological solutions to those problems. And so the goal today will be partly about understanding technologically what are security threats today, what are threats to privacy and such, but also in more real terms what you can actually do to mitigate or deal with those kinds of threats. And you'll find that much of, uh, much or all of tonight's content is in fact very real. Just to start off with a bit of a, an example, this is an example of what's called a, a packet sniffer. So we know from our internet lectures that data goes back and forth, not only across wires, but across the air, so to speak, wirelessly, using that protocol called 802.11b or G. So in this room, you have one, two, three, four, five, six 
access points, wireless access points with those antennas around the room. There's not all that much going on in this room right now, according to my laptop. So I'm connected to one of those access points. And what you see flowing up on this screen are all of the packets going back and forth in this room. And what that suggests is that you and you who are on your laptops here, if you're sitting there uh, browsing Facebook or instant messaging or sending some personal email, well, <laughs> I, we know in theory exactly what you're doing because if I actually hit the save button in this program, this packet sniffer, not only would it watch as all this data goes back and forth, I could certainly keep copies of it locally. And so when you log into AOL Instant Messenger with your username and your password, bam, I've stored it on my hard drive because you did so wirelessly. Um, so this is one of the threats that we'll talk about in just a bit tonight, uh, namely um, the insecurity of wireless data and what you can do to mitigate that. But first, let's tie in one of our earlier lectures. So we started off the course talking about hardware. And one of the things that I did in years past was um, forensics work um, when I worked for the local district attorney's office one summer. And our job back then was, again, taking media that the local Mass State Police had brought in, um, hard drives, uh, flash drives, even floppy disks and CDs. And our goal was to find evidence on these pieces of media. We, our goal was to sometimes delete files that some suspect had, in fact, tried to or had, in fact, deleted. But there was always a problem with this at least for some of these suspects. Um, let me, uh, since our projector screen here tends to get in the way, let me go ahead and do things this way. So on a hard drive, we have, um, so uh, inside of a hard drive is what? Physically, what's that? OK, so plates or platters, more properly. So platters are those like uh, metal circles on top of which are magnetic particles. And it's the alignment, recall, of those particles that actually dictates whether a 0 is being stored or 1 is being stored. If the particles are, say, north-south, it means one thing, or south-north, it means another thing. Well, what does it mean? And we touched on this briefly in a previous lecture to delete a file. Well, if this is one of those platters, and let's just suppose for the sake of discussion that this part of the platter just happens to have a whole bunch of zeros and ones that represent some very secret file, a love letter that you never want someone to see, an Excel spreadsheet with financial data that you never want anyone to see, anything that's somehow important to you. And you go ahead uh, upon deciding, you know what, I really can't leave this evidence around to delete the file. And so you drag it to your recycle bin, or on a Mac, you drag it to your trash can. And most everyone in this room now knows that that's not enough, right? Because what's really happened when you do that? Exactly. It just gets stored in the trash can or in the recycle bin, but it's perfectly recoverable and typically stays there until you proactively right click or control click on the trash can and say empty trash or empty recycle bin. Or if you wait long enough, the operating system is supposed to eventually get rid of it for you as it cleans up space. But suppose that you're, you've taken E1 and so you go ahead and right click or control click and you say empty trash or empty recycle bin. Now you can't recover it, because if you then double click your trash or recycle bin, you'll see that there's nothing there after you've clicked that particular option. But what has happened physically on the hard drive when you went and actually, quote unquote, deleted the file? Just yeah, it's kind of hiding it. In what sense? Do you recall? I recall. You say it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I guess we have to give full credit for that. What happens on disk? Yeah? Well, it's still there. You just delete the file allocation table, basically. Yeah. So file allocation table. So recall that there's some kind of table maintained. In addition to the actual bits that comprise a file, there's some kind of um, table, say like a, 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 not to conflate the two, but the equivalent of an Excel spreadsheet stored somewhere on the hard drive that has at least two columns. One column is the name of a file. And what did we say was in the other column, conceptually? where it's located, right? Because if you can store a whole bunch of bits or bytes on a disk, you can number them. Say, this is byte number 0. This is byte number 1. Now, you might be counting a long, long time, right? If you have a 200 gigabyte hard drive, that means you can count from 0 to 1 to 2 to 200 billion. So that's a lot of numbers, but certainly computers can count that high. So what happens when you actually delete a file by going to the re empty recycle bin or empty trash? Well, that table, which I might just draw very simply, again, is a very simple table, which might look like this. And in this left column is the file name. And in the right column is the location. Pardon my handwriting. It's even worse on a tablet. Well, if my file was called something like, uh, 
love.doc, and it was at location, say, 1, 2, 3, 4, where this just happens to be here, location 1, 2, 3, 4 on disk, because over here is location 1, dot, dot, dot. All right, so I'm sort of doing this on the fly. Well, what happens when you delete a file? Well, all the operating system, Windows or Mac OS, really do is erase that. What do they not appear to be touching at all? The actual bits. And so when we in the DA's office wanted to try to recover data, which frankly, given the local uh, criminal savvy, was not all that often. Usually the data was still right there on the desktop. Um, we would run special software that would try to recover this allocation table, that would try to recover the original location. And if there was just no remnants of that row in the table, so to speak, well, we would instead use other heuristics. It turns out that Microsoft Word documents, if you look at the bits inside of them, even though there's a huge amount of variability when other people, when different people make different Word documents, the start of a Word doc is always the same in terms of its bits. And the end of it is often the same. JPEGs as well. Even though photographs might look completely different, there's always a common set of bits at the top that are the same for a JPEG and a common set of bits that are the same at the bottom. And so we can look for these signatures, so to speak, and actually recover data even though the suspect or just the normal person off the street tried to delete that. So what's the good thing about this? I mean, clearly there's a downside where if you're doing these illegal activities and you need to uh, just erase all a love this letter. data. <laughs> Oh, OK, even if you want to hide your indiscretions from your significant <laughs> other. But there must be something that's good about this You're as well. You're a good cop. <laughs> I, I, this is my stance as a good cop. Okay. What is good about this? Right, so if you accidentally delete it, and let's assume for a moment that we haven't already overwritten the bits and the data that, is, that makes up the actual file, we do have the possibility of retrieving that file. So let's say that you made a couple of mistakes. And first, you dragged a very important file into your trash. And then you said, oh, shoot, I should get it out of there. And instead of taking it out, you accidentally click Empty Trash. Now, you, you might be able to, in many cases, recover that file. However, of course, you shouldn't actually write any additional data to the hard drive. Because once you start writing more data, the possibility of that same location, 1, 2, 3, 4, being overwritten by new data starts to increase. Yo. Whoa, I'm sorry. I was reading what's next on the agenda. Oh, I see. S sorry, what was the handoff? <laughs> OK. Um, wow, there's a flaw in our system, apparently. Apparently. OK. I'm ready for the next topic. Are you? I am. Okay. No, I'm sorry. What was your question? I didn't have a question. Oh. <laughs> so what's good about this? OK. Well, but the next question, though, is now how do you actually get rid of data when you want to get rid of data? That's not a question. That's not a question? Well, I mean, that's not the question that I had. What was the question you had? I didn't have a question. <laughs> then why can't you take that question? OK, so <laughs> let me fix this. All right, so this is how things work. And there are upsides of this, because it actually can be useful to recover data, because there are these remnants on the hard drive. And it's certainly good for the investigators, because they can recover data um, when someone tried to hide that same data. But the, the good cop question was supposed to be, if this is, in fact, just private data, whether it's financial data or medical records that are legitimately on a law-abiding citizen's computer, for which you might have a genuinely compelling reason to want to eliminate completely, that begs the question, how do you go about doing that? How does a normal person who has Windows, who has Mac OS, go about deleting things in a quote unquote secure way? So we've already hinted at this when we were talking about it before. I said that most of the time when you delete something, you can recover it if some other condition has not happened. What's that? Right, so if you have not written data on top, you should be able to recover it. So how then can we be sure that the data that we've erased is actually gone? We would want to do what? Yeah, write over it. Very good. So that's exactly what we would want to do. If Whether or not you want to just write over it with all zeros, all ones, any amount of writing over the data will essentially protect you from or protect the file from being read again. Now, there are third-party utilities that you can download that will do a number of rewrites, where they can either write all zeros, they can write all ones, or some collection of random ones and zeros. And many times, uh, you are given a number of options of passes to do. So for example, rather than just writing 
all zeros once over that one particular sector, that one location on the hard drive, you could write it seven times or 35 times. And so this might take a lot longer, obviously 35 times longer than one pass, but if you're really truly paranoid, you might want to do it. However, th there's not really any indication that you are getting any additional safety out of 35 times versus writing over that same section of data seven times or even just one time, but still that option is there. In fact, one of the things to bear in mind is that even this is not a perfect solution, the, the existence of these tools that Dan alludes to. In fact, one of the things we'll have you do for this next problem set that focuses on security is read an article that was written by a couple of colleagues, um, one colleague of mine and a buddy of his at MIT a couple of years ago. And the article is called Rem Remembrance of Data Past. And what these guys did and what one of them has continued to do for the past several years is buy a whole lot of hard drives off of eBay. And now he's got several hundred of these things. And what he's been doing over time is analyzing them and looking, say, for the uh, frequency of old credit card information, of um, financial information, of healthcare information, not for nefarious purposes, but to actually put some statistics to actually how common it is for hard drives to be disposed of without someone taking these good cop measures to try to eradicate steps. I mean, certainly here at Harvard or UHS, University Health Services, there's so much data on you, for instance, floating around. And it's often, you know, the IT guy who is ultimately responsible for disposing of older computers or getting rid of hard drives that, you know, maybe are too small to be kept around. And the tragedy of this is that, one, a lot of IT people either don't know how to properly sanitize disks, although fortunately the world is getting better at this, or they just don't care. Because in fact, it can take quite some time to thoroughly wipe, so to speak, or scrub, so to speak, a hard drive. Because if you have to write over every single bit, every single byte on the disk, sometimes even more than just once, just to be particularly paranoid and even uh, adhere to certain Department of Defense standards, it, just take, it can take many, many hours. And this is just not all that much fun. So if you don't mind my stealing a, bad co a good cop role, what's an alternative, perhaps, to this software-based approach, would you think? What's the most draconian? What would you do if you were completely f flipping out over something important beyond on hard drive and you have no idea, or you completely zoned out to that E1 lecture where we told you the specific software tools that exist? What might you try? Oh, I saw hand gestures. So a hammer, right? Physically break the thing is one option. Although, as you may have seen in section, sometimes it's not that easy to pop these things open. Tim? Magnets. Interesting. So certain magnets. Um, you'd have to have a really, really super fancy magnet. Um, like holding it up to the fridge probably won't work. But in principle, yes, that would work if you had access to um, a demagnetizer, something that really draws a lot of current. <laughs> a tub of acid. So better, and if you don't have a magnet, the tub of acid could work, yeah? Put it in water. Interesting. Put it in water. So, so putting it in water may or may not work because many hard drives are actually sealed. Some of them have little, um, uh, little holes to pressurize or depressurize the hard drive, but many of them are sealed. And so all you would do is ruin the electronics that are visible on one side of the hard drive. However, it is possible to replace that that board of electronics with another board and still be able to access the data. So what you want to do is essentially just destroy the platter itself. It's not enough to just destroy the electronics or even the case of the hard drive because you could still have data that exists on the platter. So whether or not that means unscrewing the top and, and taking a, a hammer to the platters themselves, which by the way make a very satisfying crunch when you start to, uh, to, uh, to destroy them. Uh, what a lot of people do is also just take um, if you have access to a machine shop, just punch a huge hole using perhaps some large metal or, or metallic drill that can, that can just literally go through the entire hard drive, just drill a th few holes in it. Depends on, what, uh, on the sophistication of your tools and, uh, and how much fun you want to have destroying the, the hard drive, really. But for people without tubs of acid, um, fortunately, <laughs> there do exist some other solutions. So for instance, um, probably. Uh, the best or best reputed piece of software that's 100% free is called Derek's uh, Boot and Nuke, DBAN. So if you just Google this, so it's or dban.org, D-B-A-N.org, this really, I think this, uh, there, is there a Macintosh version of some sort now? This definitely works on PC hardware, no matter what operating system you used to have on it. And it does. There, so let's see, Apple Power Mac. Okay, so it looks like it's in beta form. 
um, but quite possibly could work just fine. So in a nutshell, what this software allows you to do is you download an ISO, uh, which is like a CD image, and you need to have CD burning software typically, and you go ahead and burn it on a CD, although there is a floppy disk version as well, if you, uh, or a USB stick version as well. And so it does assume a little bit of savvy that one, you know how to burn a CD, and two, you know how to boot your PC off of external media, like a USB stick or putting a floppy in or a CD. Nothing that's very hard, but if you've never done it before, it might be a little new. And the only thing to bear in mind is that this literally is designed to wipe all of the data off of your hard drive. And again, it might take several hours, but when you boot this software up, probably following its instructions, which again are going to appeal more to the geek than to the layperson, just because of the nature of the software, you'll get a whole bunch of options whereby you can specify how you want to wipe the hard drive. Do you want to just write it over with zeros? Do you want to write it over with random data? Um, how many times do you want to do that? And then you just hit go. You hit F10 or some you know, keystroke you're not likely to hit by accident because it will wipe the, your entire hard drive on your computer. But the reason I personally would recommend something like this, if you do have some worries and you want to get rid of data reliably, is that as you'll see in this MIT article, these guys a couple years ago, but I'm sure it still rings true now, um, assessed um, many different software products on the market at the time, um, wiping programs, scrubbing programs, for which people would go to Best Buy or go online and shell out 20 bucks, 40 bucks, 50 bucks, paying for software that's supposed to not just wipe the whole hard drive, but just wipe um, uh, certain parts of it, right? You don't need to wipe your whole hard drive. In fact, you don't want to if you actually have data on there you still care about. But it would be nice if the software could just get rid of remnants of old files that you deleted but not touch current files that you don't want to delete. The catch is every product they evaluated was buggy and they found traces of data that was supposed to have been wiped away but the manufacturers of the software that were charging good money for this just screwed up. And so an appreciation that people make mistakes when implementing the software and that really the only true way to destroy your data is physically, if not with the tub of acid, you can outsource it to a company that does own a big drill, this is what companies do these days, um, or you wipe it on a software level, which tends to be pretty reliable because it doesn't try to be very intelligent about it, it just does everything all at once. And so generally for these sorts of products you don't want to spend a lot of money on it, for example, uh, DBAN here is, is a great free software that will allow you to do the same thing. And, and on the Macintosh side, uh, just because DBAN is not quite in, um, in production level uh, software quality for Macintosh, we do actually have built-in capabilities if you have a Mac to be able to wipe a hard disk. So if you just go to the disk utility, which you can find in the utilities folder in applications, you can select one of your many hard drives um, like I have here, and if you click on the Erase tab that's up here, you can actually click on the Security Options. You'll be presented with a list of a variety of uh, secure erasing options. So um, obviously they, the first thing is to not erase any data, but you can do uh, a zeroing out, which is a one-pass uh, It's a one pass erase where it just writes everything with zeros or you could do a 7-pass or a 35-pass erase, which basically does the same thing but 7 times or 35 times. And so all of this is, is pretty useful. And if you ever sell your computer or your uh, even a USB thumb drive, it's, we highly recommend that you use one of these methods because it is possible to recover data on very many of these things. And even if you do something like uh, format, uh, Many of the, um, this, uh, a lot of the software, for example, Windows or Mac OS, when you try to format a drive, it will say, warning, everything will be erased. But it's the same exact thing as actually deleting a file. It's just erasing the file allocation table, and all of the bits still exist. So even if you do a format, you really should do an erase uh, with zeroing out or random bits of data by one of these bits of software, one of these pieces of software that David and I have been talking about just to absolutely protect yourself. And just to get on a soapbox for a second, do you mind clicking security options again? 
frankly, this is the way the world should be. The fact that you have to go to some website, download free software, burn it to a CD, put it in your PC, like it's a mess doing this on a PC. And Microsoft, Windows, XP, and even Vista have just not made this as easy as it should be. Fortunately, macOS has gotten to a much happier place. In fact, there's an option as well. Do you mind showing them secure empty trash? Whereby when you delete something proactively from the trash can on a Mac, you can actually tell the OS, really get rid of this securely. Don't just forget about it. Yep, secure empty trash will, uh, like David said, it will not only erase its contents from the file allocation table, so not only erase its reference, but it will overwrite the bits of the data itself with all zeros, I think it would be in, in this case. And um, just to give a little bit more information, if you are going to um, sell your computer or if you have to erase the main hard drive, the hard drive that contains your operating system, or in other words, the hard drive from which your computer boots, uh, you usually have to boot into a CD or a disk in order to erase it. And that's true on Windows machines and on a Mac as well. So whereas here, I could go to uh, the security options and e securely erase one of my external drives, I cannot actually do the same thing for my internal drive. You'll notice that the security options is grayed out. So I would have to put in my Mac OS X disk, reboot the machine, and there is a disk utility in the Mac OS installer that lets me do the same thing. But now, because it's not the boot disk, I can erase the main hard drive. Just to put on one's engineering hats, why do you think that's the case? Why can't you wipe the hard drive of your computer? Because it seems so much easier just to do it that way. Right, right. I mean, it really does boil down to something that simple. If you're running the operating system and you kind of need the operating system because in the operating system is the software with which you need to do the wiping, you can't get rid of the operating system and expect the wiping to keep working. I mean, it really is as simple as that, if annoying, but as, straightforward, as simple as that. So just to, um, since I'm supposed to play the bad cop here, suppose that I am a bad guy and I don't care so much about recovering data from someone's computer. I just care about walking up to them in the library on campus and when they're not looking, stealing their laptop. What could the owner of that laptop have done in advance to increase, uh, to decrease the probability that that laptop's data will be useful to me? Well, this is for you. It's for me. Yeah, well, you're the, the good cop, so I'm setting you up rather than explaining. Well, I think answer. this is a very good question for everybody else. Oh, do you? Before I, yeah, I do. Does it know? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. No, so what can we do? I mean, short of having these really stupid, huge locks where we actually physically lock down a computer, what we are talking about is the data itself. Let's say you step away from your computer for a moment. We have a somewhat sophisticated hacker who wants to uh, just come up and just copy as much personal information as they can from your computer onto their own thumb drive and then run off before you come back from your extended bathroom break. What can we do? Yes? After so many minutes, the computer locks. So after so many minutes, the computer locks. That's true, although if uh, they have physical access and let's say they really didn't like you, they could break apart your computer and grab the hard drive, run off with just the hard drive, and they still have your data. Yes. Encryption, Encryption software, you're right, very good. So, uh, and again, this becomes somewhat specific, but there are specific uh, uh, applications or uh, software that you can download that allow you to encrypt certain portions or the entirety of your hard drive very much in the same way that we would use, let's say, HTTPS uh, in a web forum over HTTP to securely transmit information. So all of the information that's on your hard drive would then be encrypted. And so we, could, we would have to, we have to talk specifically then uh, between Macs and PCs, but um, Macs do include something built in called File Vault that essentially allows this to happen. However, it's very, very basic. Um, all it does is it encrypts everything in your home directory. So that's usually all of your documents and uh, all of your settings and your movies, your pictures, et cetera, which is generally everything that you want to protect. But sometimes you want to protect everything, which includes all of your applications or all of the this, this system-wide settings, not just the settings that apply to your, to your specific account. And there is some software on the PCs that allow you to do it. And hopefully I've blabbed long enough for David to bring that up on 
his screen? Mm -mm. No? Okay. Um, anyway, there is, there is software that exists. Uh, let's see. What is the name of the one on the, the PC? There's, there's some that are, do you know the, what is, you don't know? I don't use such. You don't use such. Well, I mean, neither do I, frankly, because <laughs> um, what, is, when we've, what we've talked about before is that there is some downside to actually encrypting all of the data. What is the downside of encrypting data? Sure, it's more secure, and we are protecting ourselves from a hacker being able to run off with my computer and be able to look at all of the data that I have created or that I have stored. But what's the downside to this? Yeah. I'm sorry? So it might take up, yeah, it'll take up a little bit more space, but that's not really the main problem here. Yes? Right, exactly. You have to decrypt it to access. So your computer has to do a number of steps. When it's writing the, the, the data to the hard drive, it has to spend the time to encrypt the data. Then when it's reading the data off of the hard drive, it has to spend the time to decrypt the data. This takes a bit of time, especially on a laptop, which ironically is the type of computer that you would most want to encrypt your data. So, and it actually is quite a noticeable hit. And for a while I tried using FileVault, and while it is great because it offers this additional level of protection, it's just not worth, or I didn't find it worth the performance penalty because now all of a sudden all of these programs that I'm, I'm using that access data take much longer to process. Do you have a yeah, comment? So, right, so um, to reiterate John's comment for the cameras, if the if a hard drive that is encrypted using FileVault, or more specifically a home folder is encrypted using FileVault, and the computer has died or the hard drive has died, it becomes much more difficult to get all of the data off of it. And it's, uh, it's exactly for the same sort of reason. When, a, uh, when the data exists in an unencrypted form, not only is it easier for the bad guys to get access to it, it's also much easier for us, the good guys, the, the people who actually own the data, to get access to it as well. So it's just very much a, a give and take, a compromise between security and performance and convenience, ease of use, all of these things. So certainly uh, you have to weigh how important your data is uh, on a computer or on how important your data is on your laptop versus you know, how much you want to risk slowing it down or how much you want to risk actually giving that data away. So there are some better solutions perhaps to encrypting some of this data. Any ideas for that? So rather than maybe encrypt everything, what could we do instead? Yes. Right, so we could encrypt a specific location. So maybe you have a little USB thumb drive. You could store all of your most important data, your, your tax information, your health information, all of this very personal, very private data that you absolutely do not want uh, getting outside of your hands. And you could just encrypt that entire uh, device. Then that way you only have, you have a little bit less space, but you're not taking the performance hit on all of your data. You're not taking the time to encrypt your pictures, which, may or, which probably are not that important to encrypt. You're not taking the time to encrypt all of your movies, which almost certainly are not worth the time to encrypt. So if you just take the time to separate out your most important data um, from your least important data, then you can encrypt only the most important data and then spend the time actually decrypting that. Yes? What happens to, if something happens to the computer that was used to encrypt it, can you still recover it? Yes, uh, in almost every case. And usually the, the reason is that when you use some specific software um, to encrypt or decrypt something, uh, you just have to have the device that is encrypted or the hard drive or the thumb drive that is actually encrypted. You have to have the software that was used to encrypt it or decrypt it, which doesn't have to be installed on one computer. You could have uh, a sea of laptops that all have the same software, but the way that you would decrypt it then is to have just some uh, password, for example. Uh, that's usually how these things are encrypted. You just have to have a very secure, very strong password, 
that is used as a key of some kind to unlock and relock or encrypt and decrypt this data. So by remembering your password and by having this specific software, you would then be able to do it. And, and I believe this is still up. Yep. So you can see that here it, it, uh, in File Vault, it's asking me to set a master password, and that is exactly the reason. It needs this key or this password in order to encrypt all of this data. If I lose that password, there's not much I can do. I'll be stuck with all of these various attacks trying to crack my own password, and that's another downside. What happens if you forget the password to your own encrypted set of files, your own encrypted folder? Well, you are quickly out of luck. But assuming that you don't forget your password, uh, that's generally not too big of a concern if you have to move it to another computer. It's really just the software that tends to matter more. So what do you do if something goes wrong? Suppose that you screw up and you accidentally delete a file and just because it's late at night or you're being careless, you actually delete the file. Or perhaps you do something even more, more um, realistic, which is you have a really important file on your desktop. You, start, you open up Microsoft Word or Excel to create a new document, but you accidentally overwrite the original one, which is even easier to do than accidentally deleting the file. Well, what can you do if you need to get that file back? Well, it sort of depends. The advice, I think, depends on the severity of the situation. On the one hand, you can get on Google, for instance, and just Google something like recover Excel files or recover JPEG files. And unfortunately, there's no one program in this world, that I, in this realm, that I recommend specifically for that. You'll get a whole bunch of options. Um, if you go to download.com and search for something similar, you'll find a lot of shareware programs, things that you have to pay probably a few dollars for, maybe in the zero to $50 range. If something worse happens, where you lose something that's business critical, like that PowerPoint presentation that you really need, or the financials that you really need, or your whole life's work when it comes to all of the essays you've written, or your stories and whatnot, if it's really important, frankly, the right approach is probably to outsource it to some data recovery company. There's a catch, though, with this. Um, what's the downside of mailing, say, your hard drive, or you know, overnighting it to someone to do it for you, do you think? And what are the concerns that might come to mind of being a consumer here? OK, so there is that, right? You're literally handing your data over to someone else whom you have to trust and whom is not, you don't have any kind of you know, uh, attorney-client privilege with some random people you found on the internet. I mean, frankly, many of you have probably read stories where some idiot goes into Best Buy with his computer for technical support. And God knows what the tech guy finds on that computer. And they usually end up calling. Um, the local authorities. I mean, this has happened too. You're putting your trust in some third party that will either maliciously or because they need to, it's their job, start poking around. What else might be a downside? Or what else might be a concern when outsourcing the recovery? Yeah. You could make the problem worse, right? If you're having a clicking sound coming from your hard drive that you can hear just by putting your ear to the computer or to the laptop, well, that usually indicates a hardware failure. And if you're jostling this thing around by dropping it on a FedEx truck and whatnot, that might just exacerbate the situation unless you're pretty careful. And the biggest one, and frankly, the one that would probably shock most of you, is frankly going to be the price. Um, I mean, take a guess how much someone might charge to recover a you know, a 200 gigabyte hard drive that suffered some kind of problem will be vague. Actually, that's not bad. Yeah, so I mean, you'll look at prices upwards of $500, $1,500, depending on how quickly you want the data, how much data you want back, and how severe the problem is. I mean, as Dan was hinting at, there's a bunch of things you can do when it comes to recovering data. One of them is you run software tools, because if you accidentally deleted a file, well, there's a lot of tools out there that smart people can use or write themselves to go find the JPEGs you accidentally deleted or the Microsoft Word document that you screwed up. If it's a hardware failure, though, that's when the costs really go up because you need expertise. You need people in you know, gloves and a white suit in a clean room, something where there's not much dust. Because even remember our video, if you get a speck of dust underneath the read head, even worse things can happen. And so you need to pay for expertise. You need to pay for those kinds of facilities. And if they need to start replacing hardware, as Dan was saying, replacing like the logic board on a hard drive, they have to go find the matching part to attach it to your hard drive just to then connect it to a PC and pull your data off. So just really realize that for the most important data out there, you will probably end up paying for it, at least if you go with someone particularly reputable. And the one that I was going to recommend before turning back to Dan here is a company called Drive Savers, which is on my computer screen, but apparently not on the overhead for some reason. 
Um, they're sort of the de facto standard in the space, drivesavers.com. But the catch is that they um, charge you for it. So. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, I worked in uh, IT at, at MIT's ISNT department for a while, and we referred a few uh, of our clients to drive savers, and they they pulled off some what what our clients considered miracles. Literally, hard drives that had been underwater and uh, been run over by a car were able to be well, at least much of the data was able to be recovered by them. Uh, it is it is actually pretty impressive, but there is a way that we can just. Sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> there is a way we, okay, you lose projector Sorry. privileges for that. <laughs> okay, so if I can just take a quick step back, uh, what I, when I was fumbling about earlier when I was trying to remember the specific software for Windows users, uh, I, I took a minute to find it and it, is, and it is this, TrueCrypt. It is actually free software that you can download and uh, I believe it has a variety of options. I haven't actually used it myself, but I know people that use it and they, they swear by it. I believe there are options for you to encrypt an entire hard drive. And there's even ways where you can encrypt uh, a, a hidden disk image or a hidden image inside of your hard drive so that you can have this sort of plausible deniability where you can say, well, oh, I don't have this data on my hard drive and there's no trace of it even though it is encrypted, uh, even though you know very well that that data exists. And there's certainly good and bad reasons for having uh, such power and such encryption at your fingertips, but uh, do take a look at it. It is very interesting software and um, will maybe allow you to get out of some sticky situations. So how can we, if we can go back to this idea of having a hard drive failure and needing to recover all of this data, how can we just mitigate this problem to begin with? How can we just not have this become a problem in the first place? Clearly, hard drive failures happen, but what can we do to protect ourselves? Yes? Yeah, backup. Clearly, backup, 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 everything. And I really cannot stress this enough. When I was in this same job, we had so many people, and literally all the stereotypical stories of uh, doctoral candidates who have lost their four-year-old thesis because their hard drive suddenly died, and oh, this could never happen to me. It doesn't matter what kind of computer you have. Apple computers, PCs, really doesn't matter. Hard drives are going to die. I've had way more hard drives die on me than I can ever count. And if you were paying attention to that, um, to the disk, uh, let's see, to the disk utility that I had up on the screen just a little while ago, you may have realized that I have an absolute ton of hard drives. And that is because a number of them are used just for backup. I have Back, I have a couple of hard drives that are used back up inside the machine. I have a, one hard drive that's external to the machine. And the reason for this is I have actually had one of my hard drives die and then one of my backups die because I hadn't tested the backup in a long time. So I lost a lot of data even though I was backing up. So just at least just have some backup, which is a different hard drive than the one inside of your laptop or the one inside of your desktop. External hard drives are relatively cheap these days. And if, even if they are too expensive, you can even get uh, very large capacity thumb drives where you can save your even most important information. If you can't back everything up, just back up the most important stuff. And I really cannot stress this enough because you will save yourself a lot of headache and a lot of money if you have to send your hard drive to, say, drive savers in order to recover this really important project or really important data that you absolutely must, must have. And would you mind clicking me back over? Not a fan of product placement, but I do like to talk about toys I have, and it's perfectly on point in this case. Um, as Dan is saying, what, what Dan's alluding to actually with his own computers is this technology called RAID, a redundant array of independent disks. This is a technology that's been around for many years, but only in recent years has it begun to eat, um, seep its way into the consumer market. Long story short, what RAID technology allows you to do is comes in different flavors, but one of the simplest ones is whereby it, this is a technology that allows allows you to put even in your own home PCs or Macs two hard drives, both of say the same size, and the computer treats them as though it's just one. And what the computer will do is anytime it writes data to the disk, it will actually write it to both disks simultaneously. And the upside of this is that if one of those drives physically fails or starts clicking or just dies completely, your data will still be 100% in theory on the other drive. And now you're sort of in a dangerous state because if you lose that second hard drive, as Dan was saying, 
you're really out of luck. But if you have a day or so to go to the store, go online, order another hard drive of the same size, what the RAID also does for you is rebuild itself. So you can take out the bad hard drive, throw it away or destroy it if you care about what's on it, put in the new hard drive, and even though you might have to follow a few menu prompts to make this happen, you can rebuild the array, the, the um, cluster of two disks that you have, so that it copies everything from old drive to new drive, and now you're back at double capacity. And one of the neatest toys, frankly, I've gotten in recent years is this product. Um, it's called a Drobo, um, and it is, if you remove this faceplate here, it's essentially the height of four 3.5 inch hard drives. So you can fit one, two, three, four hard drives on top of one another. These are SATA hard drives, so they're just like the hard drives in most of your PCs and Macs today. And you go on Amazon, you go to Best Buy, you go really wherever, buy the right size hard drive, and then you remove the faceplate of this thing and you just slot them in. And what the Drobo does for you, even though it's proprietary, is implement this same idea of RAID, whereby in any of the four drives, one of them can fail, and your data is actually very cleverly still stored on the other three. So you can rush out to the store, buy a new fourth hard drive, plug it in, it then does the requisite copying, so you're back at 100% safety, and you can again lose another hard drive after that. And what's beautiful, frankly, about this particular product is it makes what has for years been a very sort of esoteric feature of computing, RAID, and really brought it down to the layperson level, where you plug the hard drives in, you attach it to your computer via a USB cable, and you've got a really big external hard drive. And what's also compelling about it is not just this redundancy feature, it appears to you as though it's just one hard drive hard drive externally connected, even though there's four there. So if six months from now, 12 months from now, the prices continue to drop and you can get a two terabyte drive for the price of a one terabyte drive a year ago, well, that's fine. You pull out the one terabyte drive, you give it you know, a hand-me-down to someone else, plug in the new one, and now you increase your capacity incrementally. It's really a neat product, frankly. It's not cheap. It's like $500 still. But um, the flexibility and perhaps the peace of mind you get with your data is, is a nice thing. So worth perhaps considering. Who's the good cop here? Anyway. Uh, OK. And now, <laughs> that's, uh, now we're back from commercial break. Are we really? I wanted to talk about the drove a little bit more. Yeah. I wasn't going to praise it. I was actually going to say it is actually really, really expensive, I think. For the cost of one Drobo, you could literally get four or five one terabyte drives. And that's a lot of money. It's, it's a lot of space. And so if you, have, um, if you are very concerned about it and you just want the ease of use and the convenience, the Drobo is great. But if you want just to put a little bit of elbow grease into it and save quite a bit of money, you can actually build your own external hard drive. It's very, very easy. All you need is a hard drive, so an <laughs> internal drive. I mean, I guess that, that's pretty obvious. but. <laughs> You obviously need the hard drive. But then you can also buy what's called an enclosure. And the enclosure, uh, the trickiest part is just buying the right enclosure. You need to make sure that the enclosure can has, has a connection inside of it that matches that of the hard drive that you're buying. And there's only a few. There's, there's SATA, and there's also IDE or ATA. And you pick one of the two. You just buy the matching enclosure and matching hard drive. And you just literally, you, uh, you can slide in or you might have to use four or five screws and you screw in the hard drive and then you have an external drive. And this is almost always cheaper, but it is almost always exactly the same thing as these pre-built options that you can get from Best Buy or Circuit City or uh, whatever online store. You generally will save maybe about 30 or $40 in the process for the same size internal hard drive. But you're not getting the redundancy I'm preaching. You're not, but with all of this money that you're saving, you could buy two or three of these hard drives and enclosures, and you could actually just put all of your data on two separate drives. It's essentially you're getting the same protection, maybe not as easy to use as this, but you are getting the same protection. So the point of this is that there is not a better way to do it over another. The Drobo is great. It obviously has its downfalls, the price, and my way is, is awesome, but it obviously <laughs> has its pitfalls as well. But the point is that you do have options to save and protect your data. So there's no excuses. You really should go and back up your hard drive. Yes? Yes. So Dot .Mac is, uh, is an Apple product for its Macintosh computers. It's a su subscription-based 
model where you are actually given some sets or you're given a certain amount of space in online storage and you can use a, a backup program that will back up certain files to it. Uh, online storage is great and, and personally I, I think it would be wonderful to, you, to use but there are some downsides. Obviously you are sending your data to some other company and, and even though it's Apple you may or may not trust a company or even the, the data itself as it's being sent along the wire uh, to be completely private. The other thing is that it's just horrendously slow. Uh, for the same amount of space on a drobe or even an internal drive or an external hard drive, it'll just be so much quicker than sending the same data uh, to an online service. Yes? A couple of years I worked with xdrive.com. xdrive.com? You know, this is no, no. This is a very good point. So, XDrive, I don't know much about it, but it looks like a more generic form of this .Mac service where you can upload files to it. Um, and it is there is, I suppose, one of the positives about putting your data up on the internet is that you can access it from almost any internet-enabled computer or internet-connected computer. Um, I would argue that that's more useful in terms of uh, shuffling data or transferring data rather than backing it up. Uh, because a backup solution, most of the time, you just want to have it backed up, and it's not going to be uh, necessarily some very small subset of data. You want to back up as much of your data as you can. And so uh, while you certainly can use uh, online options such as this to back up your data, um, I'm sorry? I'm good, yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're going to, so yes, yeah, so xDrive, <laughs> will actually close, but there are other services out there that, that do essentially the same thing as we've been talking about. One of them, of course, is, is .Mac. But I would argue that these aren't so great for backing up because it takes so long to send all of this data, but instead very good to back up maybe very, very important or very small uh, files that you want to uh, back up onto, some, onto the internet and some cloud or some cluster of computers. Or, more specifically, maybe you just want to shuffle files from one computer to another without having to use a, CD, a CDR or a thumb drive or something like that. Can you comment on those other three which they're talking about? Can I comment on these other three that they're talking about? Box, Net, Carbonite, Elephant Drive. I have no experience with any of these, uh, so I, unfortunately I can't say. I do have experience with .Mac and uh, it was, and an, it's now, it's not called .Mac anymore, it's now MobileMe. And when they changed to MobileMe last year, uh, September or, oh no, not last year, it was just this summer, just a few months ago, they had a lot of problems in the transition, but now things seem to be up and running and smooth. Can you go to me.com? And uh, it is actually very good, but it is um, very Mac oriented. That doesn't mean that you can't connect to it using a PC, obviously, David is, is, has gone to this website using a PC and you can access all of your files and it has a number of other services as well, um, but Apple really markets this towards the Apple user base or to the Macintosh user base. And just very quickly before we go into a, uh, a break, I just did want to talk a little bit more, just make a more specific mention to RAID uh, that David had mentioned earlier. So he mentioned what's called RAID mirroring which is essentially you have two or, or some set of pair of hard drives. You could have two or four hard drives and one, one hard drive mirrors the other in terms of its data. So they are almost exactly the same. However, there is another kind of RAID option that exists. And if you're, if you're interested in RAID, you really should know the difference between the two before you start playing around with it. And it's called striping. It basically takes all of the advantages of mirroring and throws it out the window. And it has other sets of advantages. So uh, let's just take a step back really quick. And in mirroring, what do you think the downside might be of having two hard drives that have the same set of data on each? Yes? Uh, besides backup, it would be just wasted space. So it's wasted space, right. So you have to have you have to have two one terabyte drives if you want to have a terabyte of space, for example. 
But there is something else. Yes? Makes you twice as vulnerable to have your stuff stolen. Makes you twice as vulnerable to have your stuff stolen. So I suppose that depends on whether or not having two hard drives makes you any more likely to have just one stolen than just one hard drive. Um, but I think that uh, that certainly is a possibility. Someone, if someone were going to come into your home and just take one of your hard drives, the probability of it being that one hard drive is then greater because you have multiple. But um, I'm not sure it's a security issue. So let's just talk a little bit about, I mean, it's, it's the same question is out there. But now remember that what we are doing is writing the same set of data twice. So what might this mean? uses more energy, the, but more specifically, it's slower because it, takes, it doesn't necessarily take twice as long because both hard drives can write at the same time. But it's not going to be the fastest thing that's around. And that's where this RAID striping comes in. So now, rather than having a sort of automatically backed up hard drive, you now have to have two hard drives. What it does is the computer will send, as it's writing data, it will send some of the data to one hard drive and the other data to the other hard drive, and it will just be able to write it very, very quickly onto both hard drives. So it's not that you now have a mirror of the hard drives. It's not a backup, per se. What you have is you have some set of data on one hard drive and another set of data on the other hard drive with the advantage really just being speed. It's a lot faster to write to two hard drives you know, alternately rather than to the same data, writing the same data to two hard drives at once. So it's very important that you be sure to mirror your drives if you want the backup, or to use striping if you want to use the performance. So there really is, again, this uh, give and take when we're talking about all these things. And for what it's worth, I actually think we're living in a very interesting and a very primitive time. I mean, the fact that each of us in this room has to worry about the failure of our hard drives and the fact that each of us has to worry about backing up is just really not a very efficient approach to things. And I think though there are these security and privacy concerns about where you're putting your data and such, I mean, personally, I think this is inevitable. I wouldn't be surprised if it's just a few years when most of us are using things like Gmail for our email such that it's no longer sitting on our personal computers at all. All. Our data is being stored similarly on servers. Cryptography, though, and encryption does offer some reassurances that even if we're putting our data on Amazon servers or on Microsoft servers, on Google servers, at least they can't read it in theory if only we know the password. But again, there's that tension where if you forget the password and Google doesn't know it, well, no one's going to get your data for you. So there's these competing concerns. But um, I do think there's some exciting times ahead, maybe five, ten years from now, where a lot of this complexity and a lot of this need for a course like this to sort of explain this option and this option and what you do to fix this will hopefully begin to go away as things are simplified and centralized. You'll get much better economies of scale, certainly. Unfortunately, that's not the case right now. So here we are having to explain all of these things. OK, let's just take a quick five minute break. And we're back. So we've talked about passwords before. And odds are at least one of you in this room has at least one password that's laughably easy to guess or to figure out. So um, this might be a four-digit ATM code, which does not have that many digits. And therefore, there's not that many options. Maybe you've used a name. Maybe you've used a birth date. Maybe you've used anything that we might be able to gather just by knowing a little something about you. So how, does, how do technologies, say like ATM machines, mitigate this risk, whereby if someone only has a pin code that's only four uh, numbers long, that's not that hard to guess, right? If you have a bit of free time, you can try punching in a whole bunch of them. So what do you think an ATM machine does in the event that someone is trying to hack into someone's, someone's account? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So you can sort of audit the process. And you can simply have the ATM machine suck the card in and just not give it back if you've tried logging in, say, four times too many or 10 times unsuccessfully. So um, uh, computer systems are the same way. Many computers, if you try logging into a, a server or even some personal computers and you give the wrong password, say, 10 times in a row, Hopefully, they're not going to lock you out in perpetuity, um, since then everyone sort of loses. But what do you think they probably do to at least sort of mitigate this threat there. What would you hope your own laptop would do? Yeah. 
Yeah, so most computers, if they support this feature at all, just lock you out temporarily. Because if they make you wait five minutes, 10 minutes, odds are it's not going to be um, a, a deal breaker overall. It's going to annoy you, perhaps. But at least it's going to make that bad guy you know, sort of continue on his way, or at least slow down the process of hacking into your computer by so many minutes that uh, it's just not worth trying to get into your computer anymore. Yeah. Ah, so give you a secondary question. So a lot of banking sites now actually have this feature where they show you a picture that you've had to have chosen in advance and then you have to identify that picture. That alone is more of a marketing thing than a security thing because even those things can be circumvented. So realize too, and we won't go into too much technical detail with that particular example, but realize that there's also this, this tension in the world between, or this, this reality in the world whereby some of these security features are touted, much like various national security measures, really just to assure you that the site is more secure than it actually is. And by creating the illusion of some fancy new feature, can banks kind of assure you, yes, yes, choose us, come to our bank, because we have the site key feature and we have this other feature. But if you really poke around in these, a number of these features, including Bank of America's, including ING Direct's, even those things can be hacked. Not very easily. It doesn't mean your money is particularly at risk, but it does mean that it's not as much more secure as they'd like you to think it is. In fact, um, we thought we would open up this second half of tonight um, with a video clip from a movie that hopefully some of you recognize. And even if you don't, it's got Mel Brooks in it and perhaps speaks to just how laughably easy some people, perhaps uh, some of us included, uh, passwords are to guess. So a little excerpt here. the brilliant young plastic surgeon, Dr. Philip Slotkin, the greatest nose job man in the entire universe and Beverly Hills. Your Highness. Nose job? I don't understand. She's already had a nose job. It was a sweet 16 present. No, it's not what you think. It's much, much worse. If you do not give me the combination to the air shield, Dr. Slotkin will give your daughter back her old nose. Where did you get that? All right, I'll tell, I'll tell. No, Daddy, no, you mustn't. You're right, my dear. I'll miss your new nose, but I will not tell on the combination no matter what. Very well. Dr. Slotkin, do your worst. My pleasure. <sighs> no, wait, wait. I'll tell, I'll tell. I knew it would work. All right, give it to me. The combination is one. One, one. Two. Two, two. Three. 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 Four. 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 Five. 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 So the combination is one, two, three, four, five. That's the stupidest combination I ever heard in my life. What kind of thing an idiot would have on his luggage? Thank you, Your Highness. What did you do? I turned off the wall. Played it, and you turned off the whole movie. I must have pressed the wrong button. Well, put it back up. Put yes, the movie sir. Back yes, sir. Yes, sir. We gotta get that thing fixed. We're back, and we have the combination. Slide it. What? We're done with you. Go back to the golf course and work on your putts. Let's go, Arnold. Come, Gretchen. Of course, you know I'll still have to bill you for this. Great helmet. It's PG-13. Well, did it work? Where's the key? It works, sir. We have the combination. Great. Now we can take every last breath of fresh air from planet to idiot. What's the combination? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. That's amazing. I've got the same combination on my luggage. <laughs> Prepare space ball one for immediate departure. Yes, sir. And change the combination on my luggage. <laughs> Spaceballs, the movie. So we promised earlier a look at some of the data flowing across the uh, air in this room. What I downloaded was a program called Wireshark. Uh, the disclaimer I need to give is that 
do not try this here on campus, but appreciate, though, just how relatively easy this was to do. Right before lecture began, I went on Google. I Googled Wireshark, because I knew the name of the program. I clicked Download. It's a free download. I installed it. Didn't even have to reboot. And now I brought up the software here. Uh, it's a little non-obvious at first what you need to do, but generally you can follow just one or two options. Actually, let me instead go up to the Capture menu. I'm going to go to Start. It's going to ask me what I want to start uh, with. So I'm going to choose an interface. Looks like the only interface of mine that has an actual IP address and is in use is that one in the middle, the Microsoft device. So I'm going to go ahead and click Start on that one. And what you'll see is what we saw before with all the packets in this room that are flowing past. Um, appearing on my screen. And there's not all that much traffic here at the moment. And in fact, I think this is actually using a filter right now so that we're not even seeing all of it. But again, the worry here is that if you're doing something that is like instant messaging or email or pulling up Facebook profiles, it is not that hard for someone like me to just go and click in one of those packets and look inside of it. We talked about um, TCP IP a few weeks ago. We talked about the data that's actually inside of those packets besides just the IP address and such, but the actual content of your message and your emails. Well, literally, programs like this make it as relatively simple as double clicking on a row in this table as it's flowing past and taking a look at what that most recent instant message was. So in the spirit of good cop, bad cop, me being the bad cop, how do you actually defend yourself against something that, my god, is so easy to do once you know where to look for it? And again, I place the burden of the answer on you guys. <laughs> How could we protect ourselves from this? Yes? Have encrypted wireless. Have encrypted wireless. OK, so that's a very good idea for a home network. Let's say uh, uh, you have your own router and you want to protect yourself using uh, what's the one that we said that you should use? WPA. WPA, because WEP or WP, the other option, is unfortunately uh, not very secure, but let's um, take a look at something over here. Once thought safe, WPA encryption is cracked. And in fact, now no longer is WPA uh, much, much more secure than WEP. It's only marginally so. And so we have, again, a problem that uh, we still cannot really, we still cannot fix using something like this, even if we bring our laptop here on Harvard's campus where we just don't have the control over the network to be able to encrypt the wireless network. Many public networks, such as uh, Harvard, uh, well, it's not that public, but it's relatively public given the, the size of, or the number of people that are using it. But things such as Starbucks or Wi-Fi or McDonald's or whoever else has these public Wi-Fi locations generally are not encrypted. So how can we protect ourselves against attacks or people like David using Wireshark in a public location like that, if we can't set encryption at the, uh, at the source, can we do anything? I see some half raised hands. Any ideas? Yes? So yes, there is. There are some ways that we could force an encryption. So uh, every time you use a secure website, so rather than using HTTP, for example, if you have the option to use HTTPS, now all of a sudden that website, that one specific website only, is encrypted. And uh, most banks have this, uh, have this encryption now. Uh, well, not now. I mean, they've had it for a while. But many banks have this encryption where you can now uh, communicates with the website relatively securely, even though you may not be on a very secure network. But this only will help us in terms of websites or specific web pages that we can visit in order to, or web pages that we can visit that enable this secure HTTP or HTTPS. There is another way, though. If you have access to some corporate account or uh, even here on Harvard, what you have access to are big pools of computers that allow you to VPN in. So we talked at the very beginning of this lecture about VPN, about how you would have an FAS account and you would use it to VPN into Harvard's network. Essentially what this does is it makes your computer think that it is on Harvard's network. The Harvard network will give your computer 
uh, will assign your computer basically a Harvard IP address, and so you can then access web pages as though you were on Harvard's website. But the other upside, the advantage about using VPN is that just about every VPN tunnel that you create is encrypted. So now whenever you visit even unencrypted websites, if you are VPN'd in, the, you have websites that are encrypted from your laptop over the air wirelessly all the way to Harvard's servers. Now as soon as the other end of that tunnel, so VPN is, they call them tunnels, and you can think of it like that where you're creating this sort of direct connection, secure direct connection between your computer and Harvard's main center or, or the collection of computers that they have there. Now all of a sudden, your unencrypted data is encrypted between you and Harvard. However, once it reaches Harvard, it is unencrypted and sent unencrypted the rest of the way. But we have now eliminated this possibility of David peeping into what we are doing online because all of the traffic is now encrypted but, using VPN. Oh, sorry, I interrupted terribly slightly. But, 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 who does still see what you're doing on the internet? The network administrators at your company, right? Whoever is closer to your data at that point. So there are rarely perfectly good solutions to this because even then is your data, once it leaves the company, going out on the broad internet. Now granted, there's so much data on the internet's backbone that most likely you don't have an enemy who's sitting in the middle of the country looking in the hopes that your data is about to pass through some particular router. So you sort of have security through obscurity and that your data is going every which way and clouded by a whole lot of other data. So really some of these suggestions it's really just about pushing your, expanding your privacy boundaries so that they're at least beyond your immediate threats. And that might be the person in Starbucks next to you. It might be the student in the room um, next to you here. But one of the most important takeaways, perhaps, is that unless you're using an encrypted program or an encrypted protocol, you're pretty much out of luck. If you're pulling up web pages, CNN, Google, and whatnot, anyone in this room can see what's going on by nature of how the web is structured and by nature of how those websites are structured because they don't use what, what protocol that we talked about weeks ago? Yeah, HTTPS. If the URL does not begin with HTTPS as opposed to just HTTP, it means it's unencrypted, which means anyone between points A and B and in a wireless room, that's everyone, can view the data that's going across the wire. So it really depends, and at least the mentality you should now go into Starbucks with and the like is it depends on what your threat model is, like who are you worried about and what kinds of acts are you doing that you might care about. Fortunately, a lot of email servers are encrypted these days, so when you send an email from Microsoft Outlook, it's possible, but not a guarantee that your SMTP server will actually encrypt the email as it goes out. But again, as soon as it leaves your ISP servers or your company servers, out it goes on the public internet unencrypted, unless you're a bit fancy and have special encryption software installed. Fortunately, most websites, even if they don't encrypt everything, they do encrypt the imp really important stuff like usernames and passwords, so MySpace and Facebook, things that, uh, do you really care if someone sees your profile, even though you don't want, you rather they not? But you probably don't want anyone to see your username and password, or at least your password. So very often, for again, performance reasons, cost reasons in some sense, do websites only encrypt the really important stuff? like usernames and passwords, and then once you've typed in your password, they send you back to the HTTP version of the site. One huge exception to this, though, is what types of sites always maintain HTTPS. Sites like usually banks, where they sort of have more to lose, they need to reassure the public more, maybe they have more money to throw at the problem so they can have beefier servers to handle the encryption back and forth. But realize, too, if you're really just worried about you know, covering, oh, uh, make my screen appear. <laughs> if you're really just worried about um, covering your tracks or at least sort of pushing the knowledge of what you're doing online out a bit further, you can use what are called proxy servers. Or in this case, this is a specific example that's been around for a while, anonymizer.com. And this isn't to say that this is going to truly anonymize your traffic, but the idea of it, it's, kind of, it's always kind of fun to see people scribbling down URLs like this. Um, and what's useful about a site like this is that essentially, you tell anonymizer.com what URL you want to visit. It then goes and fetches that web page. And then it returns the web page to you. The implication being whose IP address shows up in that you know, sketchy or non-sketchy website's logs. 
theirs, not yours. Right, but again, you're just kind of putting your trust in someone else. No longer are you trusting, say, the website itself, but now you're trusting whom? Like these guys, right? And you're paying them money, but they don't have any personal vested interest other than you know, maybe their reputation for protecting your data. Odds are, well, maybe they're very careful about maintaining logs. But certainly in this country, has there been a movement federally for companies, for ISPs, to maintain much more data on you? And it's quite possible that a company could be subpoenaed for their records as to who was logging into their website. So realize, too, you might be paying for the service, yeah, but that doesn't mean you're necessarily getting what you're paying for. And I'm sure if you read the fine print, they probably do have to make clear that you're not necessarily truly anonymized. But there are other fancier technological solutions here. So this is a free option called Tor. And this was this sort of developed as a research project. Um, what Tor is in a nutshell is an anonymizing uh, protocol whereby you download their software, freely available. Um, when you then boot up your computer and run their software, <coughs> Your computer sort of uses some fancy algorithms to find another computer relatively nearby that's also running the same software. So it's peer-to-peer -peer in that sense. If you remember programs like, or if you use programs um, that are uh, that are peer-to-peer uh, -peer in nature, file sharing in particular, what your computer then does is it t finds a computer and then it sets up, similar in spirit to what Dan called before, a tunnel so that you can send traffic from your computer A to that other computer B. Meanwhile, you've probably set up some tunnels to some other places too, and those guys in turn have set up some tunnels as well. And so what Tor tries to guarantee is that when you request a web page, send an email, send an instant message, that email or instant message or whatnot doesn't travel directly to the recipient or directly to the website, but rather it goes through this stranger, then through this stranger, then through a third stranger whose computer then forwards it out on the rest of the internet. And so the implication of that now, it's sort of like in the movies when someone was trying to prevent their call from being traced and you have the silly little global map and it's like, sir, we're tracing the call and they're showing you the line bouncing from here to here to here to here because the person somehow was routing their call or whatever it was from spot to spot. Well, that's really what Tor does. And you pay a performance penalty, unfortunately. It isn't the fastest thing in the world. And even here, too, you got to trust that stranger down the road or in the next city over over because they could be in looking inside of your data if encryption is not actually being used. So again there, it's a trade-off. And I think what's empowering about at least hearing about these things is that you at least know the options and you don't get the, um, the wool pull over your eyes by someone just saying, oh, use this because this will protect you. It's, you have to pick, push a bit harder on claims like that. That's true, but I do think that the majority of the attacks, uh, if they were to happen to you, would be at this sort of more public level. So these, uh, this idea of someone else in the room, for example, using Wireshark or some equivalent, to be able to look at the packets that you are sending back and forth, which could contain very private information, very personal information. In order to pr protect yourself from that, you could use something as simple as a VPN to connect to Harvard. So even though like uh, both myself and David uh, went into detail about even though that data is no longer encrypted from Harvard's end, arguably, that's not such a big deal because what you want to protect yourself are from the major points of attack, which could be this public place, for example. So even though we here in this classroom aren't likely to be spying on each other, you have no idea what someone in a cafe or a, a Starbucks-like place could be doing to try to attack or to gain your personal information. Yes. How easy is it for someone sitting in a Starbucks next to you to gain access to your computer and look at what you're doing or, or uh, even start controlling it? So that really depends. I think um, pretty much for all of you, it's, it's not really a, a true concern. Where it might become a concern is if you enable um, some feature such as Windows Remote Desktop or Apple screen sharing where all of a sudden you are intentionally allowing people the ability to access your computer. Um, even with all of these though, it, it's required to have a username and password, but if you have a very basic username, a very basic password, it would not be difficult for someone to gain access. And then they could literally see your screen. And it's very similar in spirit uh, to what I was doing 
before where I was showing you the hard drives that I had in another computer uh, and I was literally just using the Windows or the uh, Apple screen sharing where now I am just logged into my computer that is sitting at home. And so it's generally not, it's probably not a good idea to have this enabled on a laptop, especially if you have uh, a very basic or very easy password, uh, very pa a password that is very easy to guess. Um, but it's generally okay if it's at home, it's behind a closed network, and you know that you will generally be the only one trying to connect to it. But accidents happen. I mean, I believe it's true that in the computer science building on campus, and they might not have even fixed this yet, one of the printers is a network printer, which means everyone in the building can print to it, but the uh, folks over in IT there, not so good with the security, such that anyone on the internet could print to this printer. And I think we were getting some guy from China's emails once in a while, because he thought it would be amusing to print things to our printer in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just because it was there. So, I mean, if you poke around and you have the right tools, you can look around on local networks and see not just wireless traffic like this, but very specific folders that people might have shared very often by accident because it's relatively easy to do. And it's not like, it's not obvious to the user, the owner of the computer, that their, their back door is wide open, so to speak. That's true. There are other protocols besides this literal interpretation of your question of literally seeing everything as it is per pixel on the screen. But you could also just gain access to the files. So not only this, but it is possible uh, to have some uh, file sharing enabled and uh, Windows file sharing for a number of years was particularly prone to being hacked and I think even on some installs being enabled by default such that it was just very easy to guess someone's password because most all Windows installations have the username of administrator so all you know all you need is administrator and someone's ridiculously easy one two three four five password then you have access to the files on their computer so that is yet another point of attack but as long as your computer is, uh, as long as you don't have these things enabled on your computer, and I can show you on a Mac, it's under the sharing pane and the system preferences. You can see I have nothing enabled here. You're pretty much safe from these sorts of attacks. Of course, you're not completely safe. There are new attacks that come out daily where someone could uh, somehow gain access or execute code on your computer. But for the most part, you're not doing something stupid and just welcoming people to your computer. So we've, tonight's theme is, is clearly threats. What concerns keep you up at night? Or what have you been told or heard that is a threat to you that, um, that is worth dissecting? Yeah. Not necessarily hack into. So recall when we discussed wireless a couple of weeks ago, a wireless router, a wireless access point has that SSID, the name that identifies it, and you can have encryption on, like WPA or WEP or off. So oftentimes in an apartment building and even in a local neighborhood, people will have home routers that are wireless that don't use encryption. So yes, anyone close enough where they get a good signal can just connect to your home network. But that doesn't necessarily mean your own data is vulnerable. Even though now that user is connected to your home's modem or your home's router, the implication of which is there you're now using your Comcast connection or your Verizon connection. Only if your computers at home have, say, file sharing turned on in an insecure way or you're accidentally or intentionally sharing files can those people actually get into your data. So this, I mean, this is the case even in my, in my apartment where I have a wireless access point, but I do use encryption. But the fact of the matter is I have friends who come over who just want to get on the Internet. And I'd be a little ridiculous if I didn't let my friends use the Internet just because I was worried about letting them onto my network. So I sort of mitigate that concern by just making sure that the files that that I do intentionally share in my home are password protected and themselves encrypted by a various means. So that, yeah, my buddy can get onto the network, but only if he sits there and really tries to hack into my machines can he maybe make forward progress. But it's not just there by nature. Excellent question. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so I have a Mac at home, mm -hmm. and you know, you click on the, the wireless thing, and it says all the local networks that are open. So it turns out 
downloaded a file a couple weeks ago, and for every reason you forgot to download it, it would shrink. So like it would start off as you know, a couple mm -hmm. megs download speed, and then it would shrink, 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 and all of a sudden you get like 1.1 kb download mm -hmm. speed, and it takes me four days to download this program. So I can't figure it out. I'm trying to figure out, you know, with limited knowledge I have, like what could be the hold up in the network, everything like that. Couldn't really figure it out if I would stop the download, restart it, and go fast again. But there is one of the four people whose networks I always pick up that isn't protected. Uh -huh. and I get faster speeds on his network in my house, just like looking at the little bars when you look down at the bars. So I switched over to network, it's not protected. I download that file in like eight minutes. Oh, yeah? Hey, man. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, that's the name of the access point? So I'm like, is this guy, you know, able to see everything that, you know, how much access does that give him? But I mean, running over that just the traffic? Or is that access, gaining access to my computer? It's a good question. So just to summarize, if you are connecting to someone else's access point, whether it's a neighbor's, whether it's Comcast, or rather, whether it's Starbucks, whether it's Harvard's, yes, anyone in the vicinity or anyone who physically owns the device to which you're connecting to, in which, in this case, the neighbor, absolutely. They could be looking at everything going back and forth. As for the security of your own computer, it again boils down to what Dan was talking about. If your computer is accidentally sharing files or you have no passwords whatsoever, then absolutely, you've just connected yourself um, in such a way that now they have a direct path into your computer. And so you need to be careful about that. Odds are they didn't even notice. Many home routers don't make it very obvious that other people are connected unless you know what menu option to click. But there was this brilliant on point article in Slashdot or some other publication, online geeky magazine type thing. Um, a year or two ago now where some guy who had way too much free time on his hands and was running a router that I think was running Linux, an operating system of some flavor, thus giving him more control over how it works. He just thought it would be a blast to leave his access point publicly accessible, so no encryption, so that anyone in the neighborhood or vicinity could connect to it. But he wrote some software on his access point that would any time the user requested some bits from the internet that included a JPEG, like a photograph, it would flip the image so that the users, if they visited web pages, all of the images would be upside down. And that is a nightmare of a problem to try to debug because you have no idea what's going on. And what are the odds that some guy with way too much free time is going to be flipping your JPEGs upside down just to mess with your mind? But these are the kinds of things you can do, which is on point in that they have total access to whatever is going through their routers. So. You know, it's, and it does show the power that, that someone who owns the router has over you because you are basically trusting that this router is transmitting your information to and from a server accurately. But any, th and, and to go into a little bit more detail, not only did he do that, uh, this image flipping, he only did it for people that did not have proper access to his router. So he figured out some scheme of telling the router that he was his laptop and all of his images would come in OK, but everybody else he assumed was, was false. And I think every day he would ch do something different with the image. So one day it was flip it, the other day it was make it really fuzzy and, and all of these other things, <laughs> make it like purple tinted or something like that. Um, but it does go to show that um, if you do trust these devices, you are, you are placing this sort of implicit or explicit trust in them that they are not damaging or recording your data in any way. But this is only data that you are sending and receiving, uh, actually connecting to your computer to obtain some information via files, via, using some file sharing protocol, for example. Uh, that's, that would require uh, quite a bit more malicious intent and, and some intentional um, hacking for lack of a better word, into your computer to try to gain access to it, unless you are literally transferring all of your, uh, so I guess we could go full circle with this. And if you are sending your, the entire contents of your hard drive to be backed up over some unsecured means, insecure means, uh, someone between yourself and this remote server could be accessing your unencrypted data. But that's an entirely different attack than what you were referencing before. There's a fun opportunity here to tie material together. So let's hypothesize for a moment this guy that was messing with people's minds and thus uh, making sure his images came out fine, but everyone else's images coming through his router were flipped upside down. Like, can you put your finger on, in an engineering sense, what he, how he could have distinguished his computer, his traffic, from other people's? 
So he could find his IP address, which belongs just to him, presumably, and then just say anyone with a different IP address should not have this happen to them. Let's, suppose, let's push a little harder. As you know, IP addresses can change because of DHCP. It might change every time he boots up his computer, so it might be different every day. OK, so you could set it to a static IP address. So say, always give me this. But let's push a little harder. What else could he do? So that so-called MAC address. So remember that duality of addressing in computers. You have the IP address that's sort of up here, and then the MAC address, the Ethernet address, that's conceptually a little lower, a little closer to the hardware. One is like the unique serial number. That doesn't change. One is the IP address, the logical address. That does change. So either of those might have been viable options. And who knows? Maybe he did it in a different way altogether. But the neat thing, hopefully, is that ooh, you too can hypothesize now how he might have done that. If I can play bad cop for a second, actually. Uh, it is certainly possible that he used the MAC address. And it's as if you remember, the MAC addresses are very long and very difficult to guess. However, it is possible for a computer to spoof a MAC address. So uh, even, though this, even though all of our laptops that are connected to the wireless network are communicating their MAC address with some of Harvard's servers, for example, for DHCP is just one of the examples, uh, it is possible for somebody else to come on and spoof uh, their computer is mine by just by taking my MAC address, but they have to know it, obviously. But it is possible um, to be able to spoof that as well. And not even, I mean, I'll push a little harder there. So you are some miscreant with a laptop in the Harvard Yard. You want to get on the internet. You have some savvy, and you don't have a Harvard ID. Therefore, you can't register your computer and return your Ethernet address, your MAC address, but you are determined to get on this network. Well, we've just seen that it's not all that hard with someone with an internet connection and you know a bit of sap. Oh, make my screen up here. <laughs> I don't have a button, so. Um, so it's not that hard for someone to sniff traffic. And if I actually look closely inside these packets, besides the actual information going across the wire, what else is in there? Right? The origin, the destination. Right? Otherwise, where is that data going if there's not some remembrance of where it came from and where it's destined for? So you could even figure out, in theory, someone's MAC address just by sitting next to some unsuspecting freshman in the yard. And then as soon as they amble away and leave their internet connection, you just steal their MAC address and get on Harvard's network. So granted. Cambridge has free wireless now, as I recall, so maybe not such a big deal anymore. But um, certainly, the possibility remains if you have sort of the time and you know, the, the, the incentives to do such things. Other threats that come to mind or have worried you or you've been scared by because someone else said it was true? Trojans. Trojans. What's a Trojan? Uh, well, middle school, me and my buddies connected to each other. <laughs> <laughs> This is like the confessional of the classroom <laughs> over here tonight. OK, so a Trojan is an example of, and, and you can spin this different ways, an example of what most people would call some kind of virus. A virus being a malicious piece of software that, believe it or not, someone has taken the time to write. These uh, viruses do not appear in the wild because of mutation or any physiological origins, but because someone with, again, too much free time sat down and wrote it for fun because they could, wrote it to find it for financial gain, just to recap havoc. But all of these viruses, all of these worms, which are similar in spirit to viruses that have appeared on people's computers over the years, are written by people. And sometimes, you know, 12-year-olds in other countries, 18-year-olds. I mean, it's usually some uh, fairly introverted person, it seems, who lives in their basement or their bedroom mostly, and then makes the idiotic mistake of bragging to strangers in a chat room, which is, seems all too often how these people are caught. But there's a lot of dangers out there. I mean, if you download Norton, if you buy Norton antivirus, McAfee antivirus, antivirus, any of these commercial products these days, they recognize thousands of different threats that have been released on people's computers over the years. Um, some are very similar to others, because it's a lot easier to take an existing virus, tweak it a little, and call it your own. But there's a great number of threats. And as your story sort of hints at, this being a Trojan, the idea being from the Trojan horse era, where you have a piece of software instead of a wooden horse, put it on someone's computer, and it 
outpours bad things that can do anything. And this is the problem. A virus is just a piece of software that someone written. So if you can imagine a good guy or a bad guy writing a piece of software, that software can take the form of a virus, which can be sent intentionally or unintentionally via email to other people. A worm is pretty much the same as a virus, but a worm doesn't need a person to accidentally click a link or to forward it to someone else. A worm is self-propagating, which means once your computer is infected with a worm, it will spread to other computers if it can without your ever opening an email, without your doing anything. So viruses, like the word implies, require a host, like a file. So files get infected because a virus attaches itself to the first few bytes of the file, in the middle of the file, at the end of the file. And so when you open that file and trigger those bytes to be loaded into memory or executed, bad stuff actually happens. But a worm is worse because it self-propagates without humans needing to intervene. What I would argue is that a lot of these attacks, so there, we do have a lot of worms, viruses, trojans that exist that are problematic for our computers, but what seems to be the biggest problem aren't these programs, it's literally user error or, or uh, users trust in some event that is occurring on a computer that uh, hackers can exploit. And there's a lot of social engineering that goes into this and phishing is just one example and we'll, we'll probably talk more about that next week, I'm guessing, uh, that really uses this sort of social engineering or this aspect where we are assuming trust in some particular device or some particular event that is taking place and someone is using that against us to, to their advantage. Yes. I'm sorry. Hmm? I, I just had a security hmm? question. One of the big things for me is I am not afraid to use credit cards online as long as hmm. they stay encrypted. And I was, before my credit cards being fired, I go through all the sites. So I have it on PayPal, um, Amazon, um, eBay. Still taking notes? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, so that's a good question. Uh, to repeat for camera, credit card transactions online, how secure are they? So the transactions themselves are pretty secure, at least in principle. You no longer have a human on the other end of the phone. You no longer have a stupid piece of black carbon paper that has an imprint of the numbers, um, which can be stolen or copied elsewhere. There's no human involved in almost all of these online transactions. So in that sense, I would argue that most online credit card transactions are more secure because there's no middleman. There's no human and the bits are just going back and forth quite quickly I would add between computer or you and another computer the server but the catch is as you know those servers are very often saving your data because you want them to or because they choose to and so more common perhaps than individual users computers or computers being targeted is the databases of companies so to tack on a uh, to tie together our threads with um, this notion of packet sniffing, there was a couple, one or two stories in the past year or two where some guys were sitting in the parking lot of like a Lowe's hardware store, maybe it was Home Depot, just sniffing the wireless traffic from the local store. And because the store did not encrypt their wireless traffic, and because the store's computers, their servers inside the building were not themselves very secure, these guys were literally able to sit in their car and grab data from inside the building because it was not very secure. Unfortunately, they, like a lot of these idiots, stayed in the parking lot too long and eventually got caught. Um, but the point, though, is just how accessible this data was. Frankly, when it comes to credit cards, I think we're at a point technologically where that's a problem for um, political protections, commercial protections. I mean, I trust that Amex will deal with the fraud issue if my credit card is stolen. And I think realistically, unless you're going to live in a cave without using online transactions at all, you really lose control over a lot of that kind of data. But I would say these days, for me certainly, it's an unacceptable risk. I think nothing of you know, using my credit card because I monitor my statements and Amex does the same and they have built-in protections. So I think that the protections there are not so much technological as they are policy oriented. If I can bring this even more full circle, we were talking before about how important it is to back up all of your data. Well, companies certainly do this with your information that they are storing. Um, but we come back to this idea of human error, user error, where 
people, they may back up all of this data, but they may back it up in an unencrypted manner. And perhaps what's more of a security risk than them actually storing it on their servers are these idiots, these IT idiots that carry around backups of all of this data unencrypted in their backpacks or in their briefcases or whatever, and they get stolen out of their laptop. And we've been hearing a lot about this, not so much here, but especially in the United Kingdom in England, where this has been happening with government records just all of the time in the past few months. And so that seems to be more of the threat than actually using your credit card online. And, and just like David, I would, I would argue that um, using or storing your, your credit card information in a fairly large, well-reputed site is not so much of a big deal, uh, especially since all of the, the credit card transactions are verified per transaction, hopefully by you actually taking a look at your statement so you can immediately recognize when some transaction was made that was fraudulent and you can identify that. And just about every credit card company that, that I know has very good protections against fraud and you're very well protected against them um, using your money. So oftentimes a lot of the, or often a lot of the burden of the, this data protection is placed on the companies because if the companies screw up and they're getting a lot of uh, fraudulent purchases against the credit card company, the credit card company will push back and not actually give them that money that, that they were supposed to be given. But there are some lines I would draw on the sand. So I have sort of accepted for myself that email, it's not all that secure. I'll sit down in some other country at an internet cafe, check my email, even though it means inputting my password. I sort of accept that as a possible risk. My bank account information, though, for instance, I never check it unless I'm on my own laptop or my own desktop at home. I would never pull up my bank account at an internet cafe. I wouldn't even do it on a friend's computer just because that's the line I've drawn for myself. I have no control over those computers. And even though, in theory, I have control over my own computers, we all know that things can get onto your computer that you didn't intend to be there. Viruses, Trojans, worms, all the same kind of bad software. So even then, even when you're using your own computer, are you trusting that things are okay? And so it's, I think it's totally understandable to live in a bit of doubt as to just what you should be doing and where. But I also think there are some rules of thumb. And if you take away nothing from me, at least tonight, it's that I would not check bank accounts on any computer other than one that you yourself control or know or are comfortable with. Because for me, the ability for someone else to just get my username and password and write himself a check or send some money elsewhere, that's sort of too easy. And I'm much more worried about cash leaving my account than, say, a charge being put on my credit card, which is more easily reversed than cash coming back in. I think if, you're, if anything is to be taken away, it's that you really have to define your own line of paranoia. How much is, <laughs> is too much defense? And I mean, if you were to take all of these suggestions that we've been talking about, File Vault or TrueCrypt, and overwriting all of your data with 35 passes, you would spend all of your time on security and none of your time actually getting anything done. Or if you were just so paranoid that you weren't going to use any of this technology, well, that's equally as pointless, I would argue. So you have to figure out what you think are the highest threats to you and defend against those. And for the rest, you just have to do your best in terms of protecting yourself against them. Bring us home. Really? All right. Well, unless there's anything else, thank you all for coming. We will see you next week where we will continue security.